a member of the Logan County League of Democratic Women, and I also currently serve as the chair of the Logan County Democrats. And tonight we're coming together to discuss how an idea becomes a law. And we're going to talk about this. We have a, a panel here tonight. And so on the heels of the largest voter turnout in history, we have a lot of people who are wanting to get engaged and who want to um, learn how to get engaged in the process. This discussion came about as a result of a Facebook post, of all things, um, letting us know that the legislative deadline for this session is going to be December 11. Um, so along the lines of people getting engaged, we just want to put some form around that word and what that actually means um, for both the newly registered voters and the people who have been in the process for years and years. And to help us with that tonight, we have a panel here. Um, first of all, we have Representative Trish Ranson. She is the representative for House District 34. She is about to start her second term. We also have um, Miss, is it Tamaya? Mm -hmm. Tamaya. No, you're right, Tamaya. Mm -hmm. Tamaya Cox Teray. She is the executive director for the ACLU Oklahoma. And we also have with us Roxanne Logan. She is the Southeast Oklahoma field organizer for Together Oklahoma. So to get us started out, Representative Ransom, if you'll just give us a short introduction about yourself and we'll just get the conversation going. Well, great. Thank you, Stacy. Um, like you said, I'm Trish Ransom. I'm representative for House District 34, which is Stillwater proper. My area is very small, um, although I represent about the same number of voters as the other districts do. Um, but we're very compact here in Stillwater. And um, uh, this is my start of my second term. Um, and each term is two years long in the House of Representatives. So um, I came about being a representative through advocacy uh, in the sense that I was a school teacher and I was part of the teacher walkout. And that experience uh, led me to run for office in which I ran and won in 2018 and then ran again in 2020. And so looking forward to the next session. Awesome, thank you. All right, Tamaya, yeah. go ahead and push yourself. For sure. Well, good evening. Um, my name is Tamaya Cox Ture. I'm really excited to be here. And um, as Stacey said, I am the new executive director of the ACLU of Oklahoma, being on the team for about a week now, exactly a week today. Um, but I have been lobbying um, in, in public policy work um, my entire career, so the last 13 years. Immediately after law school, um, I was actually interning at the ACLU. And from that experience, which was an amazing experience and trying to figure out what I wanted to do with my um, law degree, I really witnessed how public policy impacts, has the greatest impact on people. And that goes both ways. Um, and I really have this yearning and the, this, this thirst to fight for justice. Um, and I could have done that in the courtroom um, but I really chose to do that under the dome. And, I, and many people who know me have heard the same time and time again, but I truly believe it, that when policy is created without people considered, that's where oppression lives. And that really was my kind of how I got into really thinking that I could still fight for justice. I could still use my law degree, but just really under the dome work is really where I believe um, um, a lot of the impact will have. And so I have been working in public policy as a lot registered lobbyist for the last 13, 14 years and really look forward to sharing some of my experiences and really most importantly, how people can get involved in, in, in that, in that um, work. Awesome, thank you. Roxanne, go ahead and introduce yourself, please. Well, uh, like you said, my name is Roxanne Logan and I am the Southeast Field Organizer for Together Oklahoma, which is the grassroots organization of Oklahoma Policy Institute. And we are a nonpartisan uh, think tank as far as Oklahoma policy goes. And uh, every year Oklahoma policy comes up with the issues that they want to focus on. Um, and then it is uh, together Oklahoma's job to reach out to all of the chapter members, advocates, and 
then make contact with the legislators trying to uh, push the ideas. And one of my main jobs is to teach advocates how to uh, reach out to their legislators, how to talk to their legislators, uh, what's the best way to do it, uh, and how to, once they make contact with them, how to get their points across. Uh, and to understand that legislators are nothing to be feared. They are just people like they are. Uh, and, you know, they get up, they eat breakfast, and they go to work. Uh, they are sitting in the chairs at the state capitol because we put them there. And it's our job to hold them accountable. Awesome. Thank you. And, Madam um, Chair, you put together an awesome panel, and it just kind of covers the whole scope. So we have the, you know, the grassroots level, the policy level, and then our, our legislators. So we can hit this from all different angles tonight. Um, one of the first things I wanted to talk to you about is a, it's a story that um, Chairwoman Harkins had of whenever she went to a, a listening session for a legislator and basically someone in the crowd asked, how do I, how do I get a bill made into a law? And the response was to that constituent was basically hire a lobbyist. So you can see, you can tell how that went over in the crowd. What would be your suggestion, <laughs> just just to get the ball rolling, what would be your suggestion if somebody just has an idea of the steps that they should take? Uh, what's the first step that they should take? Who are you asking? Are you asking me? Are you asking everyone? What? <laughs> well, we're asking everyone. We'll start with you, Representative Brinson. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You talk first, you get to answer for sure. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, um, my answer to that question is um, advocacy is relationship. So if you're wanting to advocate for something that you are, you feel very heartfelt about, I mean, you are the perfect person to advocate because you have that feeling about that subject. Mm -hmm. um, you have to form a relationship. And when, um, you know, bills, bill ideas come from all over the place, um, but you don't necessarily need a lobbyist to get a bill created. And when I first ran, I thought, okay, well, I mean, I, even just the thought of running for office, well, I can't run for office because I'm not a lawyer. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I found that that was my false idea of what legislators are not all are lawyers and we have a staff at the capitol that are lawyers that that write bills so my point is that you know you can have the idea you can talk through that with your representative who can then with how staff craft the legislation language that you need for a bill um so it really is just the idea and the desire for that that i idea to become a bill to become a law is really what you need to start creating that relationship with your representative. Awesome. Yeah, I completely agree with that. And, and I think the first thing a person should, should do um, regarding if they have an idea is to really find a way to hone in that idea and, and really by themselves, they don't necessarily need a group of people if they have like-minded people. Um, that, that really share in their passion or share in their affinity toward this topic, bring them in for sure, but really, really put that idea on paper. And, and I think that's really important because um, a lot of times in my experience, folks have this great idea, which is great. And then they just go to their legislator, but don't have like the, 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 all the ingredients maybe necessary to really get that further. And there's not necessarily a problem with that, some of the issue comes is that then that legislator may take that bill and make it their own or the fact that because there are bill writers they could really um not get to the heart or get really to the root cause of what that person's intention was so really my suggestion first is if you have a great idea um be passionate about it and have the tenacity to really um have the tenacity to really get it on paper. And it doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to be in legalese. It just has to be, what is the idea? What's the impact? 
and really kind of dissect, you know, what is the cause that you want? You know, ultimately, what do you want to do? What is the impact? Um, a lot of us in the organizing world, we use um, a, what we call a strategy chart. And it's this great, um, it's this great um, um, document to really help you kind of figure out who's all impacted by this law. Who do we need to bring in on this law? And it's really almost like a step-by-step. The very the only thing that a person really needs to do from that I did to become a law is really the willingness to kind of be vulnerable and put themselves out there and fight hard for it. Okay, that's a good point. It's not a it's not a one time conversation. You don't no. just send them an email and say, "Hey, could you do this?" It's it's mm -hmm. constant follow up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and I have been asked this question before, and and I always tell them. If it's really a passion of yours, mm -hmm. do your research to start with before you approach your legislator. Yeah. Uh, know, you know, know who it affects, know how it affects you. Uh, and you do some of the background, get some of the details, because the legislator that you are approaching to help you may not know as much about the subject as what you know about the subject. Mm -hmm. So write something out for them, explaining why you want this, why it is a passion of yours and how it has affected you or your family or your community, how you think it's affecting your state. But provide them with as much information as you can. And then you work as a team mm -hmm. to try to turn it into a bill. And Representative Branson, that's that's true in the fact that you you then become the carrier of that bill through the, all the committees, and you you need to be able to speak to that bill um, intelligently and with the same passion that the people that are recommending it. You're on mute. You're right. <laughs> Sorry. Yes, and you're right because I also need to be able to answer the questions because there will be questions from multiple representatives, sources of of what the bill really does and if i don't mm -hmm. understand it then that's a problem too so we want to make sure that it's not a one conversation it's it's multiple mm -hmm. conversations and educating your representatives so that that way they can carry the bill the best way mm -hmm. and then going back to your point roxanne about uh, doing the research prior to that um, i think we have a lot of new um, voters in the process right now and they need to know where the best place to try to get this bill passed is, is it at the local level? Is it at the state level? Is it right. at the federal level? Um, so that you can, you know, not waste time, you know, essentially going to the wrong level of government to do that. Right. right. And, and I think actually, Stacey, that's actually a great point is trying to figure out, um, you know, once you get this bill or once you want this policy to be passed, Mm -hmm. kind of what is the next step or not even what the next step is but does it have to become a law can you get it through like an executive order or through an agency if mm -hmm. you're dealing with you know some of our state agencies so so doing your homework um i stress is one of the best things that can happen you know and in and, and in a time where we have access to the internet and we have access to many organizations that also have that information um, uh -huh. Utilizing their skills would be is really great. The number one, I think, um, maybe advice I give to people when when really thinking about um, legislation is just know the process. Do your homework before all of this because the worst thing you can do is go to your legislator with an amazing bill and then it's past deadline, right? Like it's it's yeah. mm -hmm. or or they they have they only have so many bills that they can push forward. Um, mm -hmm. so, so really just kind of doing as much homework and prep work prior, just one shows how credible you are. And I think that really helps legislators be like, I have a credible resource. I know the information I'm getting from this person is accurate. I know that they're going to be on time and, and, and all of that. So, so I think that's um, a good point. Uh, just some good advice for folks is really just do as much research about the process prior to really thinking about, you know, the, the ins and outs or getting into the weeds of, of the policy. Yep. Right. That's a good because, point. Because the Go ahead, Roxanne. The representatives, correct me if I'm wrong, Trish, but the representatives can only introduce eight bills a session. Um, Is that correct? 
we can present more, but they won't. They'll take your top eight as priority. Okay. Basically. That's what yes. But the senators mm -hmm. can introduce an unlimited amount. That is correct. Which they I don't understand. Have, well, they that only have 50 doesn't. of them. <laughs> yeah. No, that's true. <laughs> Yeah, and then I, that brings up the point that you may be in kind of for the long call because if it doesn't make it in that first session, it can come back in the next session, correct? If it's if it's not taken in that first session, then it can come back. It basically picks up where it left off. Um, but then once it hits the two-year session period, then um, it's it has to be reintroduced as a brand new bill. Okay. All right, so basically have an idea, flush it out, do your research and be ready to stand to the stand uh, um, for the long haul. Um, this basically what we're hearing out of that um, discussion. So, um, so once the bill is formed, um, that, that's when it comes. So on December 11th, you get all the bills and basically a pile. And then what happens with that pile of bills that have come in? Well, um, basic, basically, December 11th is the deadline for me to present my ideas. Okay, so I present the ideas of the bills that I want to, to file and I, the language, kind of what I want it to do to have staff. And then um, it goes into, um, it starts to be drafted at that question. point. I'm not sure who, what line is breaking up. Is it on my end? I'm not sure. Oh, is it me? Well, I don't know. <laughs> who knows if we can tell? <laughs> Seems like it's during while I'm talking. Maybe it is. Yeah. Once you mute yourself, and then come back in. Let's see. Oh, All right. Let's try it again. We're going to like start over. Um, so basically, I have to have the ideas ready to go. And then the language gets worked on in December through January. And then the January date is when that bill has to be in final language form to be presented. Okay. What I'm going to have you do, uh, Representative Brand? is if you could drop off and then come back again, we'll see if that okay. clears up your connection. Okay. okay. So um, while, she's, while she's coming back in, um, at this point, whenever, whenever you all have submitted something, what are you all doing at this point? Are you, are you keeping an eye on it as it goes through the, the, the writing process? Or is there any, do they need any help from you at this point? I guess is the question. Oh. For sure. So typically, um, I think typically it really is about, um, yeah, typically I think it's really about um, this for advocates, right? So for organizations and advocates on our side, it really is about doing some power mapping um, around the bill. So hopefully we have the language that we want, we have the sponsor that we need. Um, but really, how do we, you know, move the needle or how do we really think about how we're pushing the legislation forward, um, forward at this time? And, and so what we really do is ensure that we know three things about the bill. We know the bill's impact, you know, what, who's the constituency or who's the audience the bill's going to impact. We know the cost of the bill. Um, um, and that's really important for us is to really know like because we are in Oklahoma and, and I have to be real I have to be realistic. So I work for ACLU now. Prior to the ACLU, I was with Planned Parenthood. So very for some people, very controversial uh, organizations. So we play a lot of defense. Um, um, and so, so our goal is to know that because we know the type of bills that we are trying to push, even though we know that these type of policies are actually moving Oklahoma forward, we have to have all of our ducks in a row. And the biggest, biggest thing we can do is really think about the fiscal impact of the bill. What's it gonna cost taxpayers? Um, if it is gonna cost taxpayers, you know, what, what does that net benefit? 
Um, and, and that shouldn't, that's not always a bad thing. Just because a bill is associated with a cost, even in a, um, you know, in, even in a financial struggle that many of our, um, that we're in just in Oklahoma because of our budget, um, that doesn't necessarily mean that a bill is not going to get passed. So, so it's really important for organizations. And, and, and not organizations, but just people that are trying to pass policy is to really know the fiscal impact. Again, because if you can go to a legislator and be like, hey, um, this bill is going to have a $1 million fiscal impact, but the net benefit, you know, of getting people, um, you know, health care, for instance, or, you know, is so much more. Um, that only adds to your credibility. And, and I think that's ultimately what, what advocates and, and lobbyists and, and people working in policy have to do is just show that they are a credible resource to legislators um, and, and be that, and making sure that any information that, that we give legislators um, or policymakers is accurate, is um, factual. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, ultimately, those tend not to be, at least for the organizations I represented here, that that's never a problem. Yeah. And well, and, and I would like to say that in advocating uh, for a particular bill, a particular cause, uh, you need to remember that your legislator is not an expert on everything they're going to face. Mm -hmm. And they depend on the advocate to inform them of the details. When you go to a legislator's office and you're sitting down in front of them, you need to already have a, a bullet point list made out of what you want to show, what you want to teach that legislator about why you think this is so important or why you don't want them to vote yes on this bill. Uh, so you need to provide them with the information so that they can make the decision that you're wanting them to make. Just don't go to them and say, well, I want you to vote no, or I want you to vote yes. You need to go to them basically with your elevator speech as to why you want this passed, how it affects you, how it affected your grandma, how it's going to make a difference in homelessness in your town. You have to have that information and you have to be prepared to provide it to them. And you need to teach them about why you think it's important. Such a, such a great point. Um, I'm very fortunate in my last job, I, um, I did lobbying here locally um, in Arkansas and then on the Hill um, in DC and in every, state is different when it comes to their the the how you know how people advocate um in some states where they have public testimony um they allow for the public to come in and really talk um that is not a that's not an option that oklahoma has we even though the the, the chair of a committee could allow for public testimony in my 13 14 years i've only been able to testify for two minutes um, in one committee. Um, and so so as Roxanne said, that the fact that you have to go in and talk to legislators, have your one pager, be as, you know, be being able to, to speak um, succinctly and concisely about your bill, but having as much important the information and bullet points, it's so important because of unfortunate, the fact that, you know, that you and your group are usually the only people that's talking about the bill and the only time a legislator is gonna hear about um, the impact of, of your bill and the importance of your bill. Good, um, I'm sorry I keep dropping out. If I could advocate for anything, it would be for me to get some better Wi-Fi out here in the country, but <laughs> I think that's on everybody's plates right now. So um, thank you um, for keeping that conversation going there while I was trying to get that all worked out. Um, so as far as, so, so say you don't quite have an idea, but you would like to just advocate in the process of all of the bills going through, what are some of the recommended ways that someone can keep up with a bill or a, a specific 
kind of uh, subsection of bills, let's say they're into education or criminal justice reform, what's the best way for someone to engage in that process? Maybe call the legislator when it's time for a vote or um, something to that effect. Well, actually what, what I use is uh, it's an app. You can either have it on your phone or on your computer and it's called Bill Track 50. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can look up any bill you want to look up. You know, all you have to do is know the number of it. Or actually, on the new Bill Track 50, you don't even have to know the number of it. You can just say, I want to see all the bills related to Medicaid. Or I want to see all the bills related to criminal justice. And with the new Bill Track 50, it will automatically populate you a list of all the bill numbers related to any particular subjects that you want to keep track of. And then in this software, you can tag these different bills mm -hmm. and then it will show you the progress they are making as they move through the legislature. It, okay. You will see when they're introduced, you'll see when they're in committee um, in the Senate, you'll see when the Senate approves them, you'll see when it's sent to the house, you'll see if it's still in committee, if the house makes any changes, it goes back to the Senate, the Senate has to approve it again. And, you know, eventually until it's either signed or vetoed, you can track these bills from the beginning to the very end. Okay. So I, was, gonna, yeah, I would just suggest um, also following your favorite organizations um, because, um, because legislation, be, because Oklahoma has become more transparent with the legislative process and maybe they've done in the past, more and more organizations, whether they're um, more and more nonprofits, what, even if they're C3s, they're following legislation. Um, so definitely follow um, along with your uh, reaching to your favorite organization and asking them and seeing what topics they're following, I think mm -hmm. is a good way to follow those. Um, and, and the okhouse.gov or okaysenate.gov are both better websites than they've ever been right now where you can, if there are a set of bills that you're trying to follow where you can track the bills like Roxanne was saying, and, and it will tell you every time that that bill, you know, makes any type of movement, it will alert you. Um, the, 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 the issue has to be, if these are issues that are really important to people, then they ha also have to make sure that they're doing their due diligence of following and being um, up to date. Yes. Um, um, and that's the important part is that we have a responsibility and a duty um, on our is that really important to us that we're also doing our part to ensure we know what's going on. Right. And even, even when the bills are in committee, you know, you can look up on, on bill track 50, you can look up who the members are in that particular committee. And while it's in committee, you can reach out to the committee members and advocate at that point too, before it gets on the floor to be voted on. Every step yeah. of the way that that is moving through the progress process, you still have avenues to reach out to whoever's touching it at any particular moment. Yeah, that's Do you think true. I, I, I've fun. gotten multiple emails of, of people who have sent me an email because I was on the committee and, you know, all of a sudden I'm getting a, a slew of emails about something. I'm like, what's going on? And then I look at my agenda for the committee and go, okay. That's I need to read this bill tonight to get ready for my committee meeting tomorrow because it does it it alerts you and you can actually take action on it and that that could be for a bill that you're you're really wanting to support it could also be for a bill that you really oppose and so knowing that both ways then that's a good way a good piece to stay connected with your representative or your senator and to make sure that they understand what your feelings are on on that said bill. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and Representative Ranson, I think, brought up a great point. So another, I guess, tip from, from folks that have done this is that committees are so important. Committees are the backbone of the work in Oklahoma. Um, and for many of us, that is where we do most of our work. We, If we want a bill to get passed, if we want a bill to, um, to die, we really focus on committees because if you think about it, 
it's easy. A committee's could, a committee could have from eight, you know, to, to 20 or 30 people, depending on what committee it is. So if you have an opportunity and you want a bill to progress or not progress, to talk to eight people or 30 people as opposed to 101, that's where you want to put your effort and your time and your energy. Um, and so I think there's an opportunity really to, to, for those that are thinking about pushing policy is to really think about the committee and prioritize committee work um, right now. You know, organizations do not have, unfortunately, you know, a lot of money toward legislative work and their legislative agenda. So to really um, to to really scrutinize where those dollars go to, you know, invest in some money to to do some committee work and, you know, and, and lobby the committee members. I think that's uh, some of your best effort right there at that process. You know, when I first came into the House and I saw that I was on four different committees. You know, I had the assumption that the committees was where we were going to do the work on those bills and we would be able to ask all the questions that we had. And I found out that quite the opposite is true. Um, one of the first days of my first committee, it, the first bill, um, there was immediately the bill was presented with maybe two sentences describing it. And then somebody said, do pass. And it's like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. I have questions, you know, and, and, and even if it's just a, um, in committee, you're going to see this bill. Can you ask this question? And just mm -hmm. even at, say, you know, cause, yep. cause sometimes, you know, I'll read a bill and I won't understand what the, the, um, repercussions might have for it because it's not a subject. Like, like you said, Roxanne, I don't have knowledge of everything. And so I may not understand what the repercussions are and I don't even know what question to ask. Mm -hmm. But if someone said, you know, this is a really big topic, ask this question. Yes. And if you don't like the answer, then, you know, I mean, just give me that much. And that, that helps a lot. And, and I've had some, some bills where someone had, you know, a friend, because we had a relationship and they said, Trish, this bill's coming up. Um, these are the questions I have on this bill and I don't think it does what it says it's going to do. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then I can look at those questions and I can ask those questions. And, and that's a big piece of advocacy right there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Such a, such a great point is that sometimes questions in my experience, at least are sometimes to elicit an answer, but a lot of times to expose that, the other, maybe the author of the bill who is pushing a bill you don't agree with, trying to expose that they don't have all the information. So even thinking, being strategic about those questions in committee, um, whether it's committee or even on, on the floor is really important as well. Um, and I know that, you know, right now we're, the idea is really we're talking to people who just have an idea and how to get um, their idea out. And so that seems like it's in the weeds, but I think this is like the whole approach, right? Like this is the opportunity to really think about everything than everything you want, anything you need to think about when it comes to le legislation. So um, I, I, think th I think that's really important. Yeah, and I think it's real important when you reach out to uh, your legislators. Uh, before you ask your question, kind of tell a little bit of a story as to how this affects you and, and and give some history to give some life to your question it will mean a lot more than just you know asking the question if they know why you're asking the question uh and they understand a little bit about you then they they will have you know they will be able to better answer or ask the question once once they are in committee Mm -hmm. Great point. Yeah. But keeping brief is is good because mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> there are times where I've I've had a very long story before the question came. So yeah. always make sure that yes, a good story yes. is great and it helps tie it, makes it personal, but make sure it's brief and to the point. Too. Right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. I think that's a great Great, great point. We do um, a training called Story of Self. And the Story of Self train really is an opportunity to get your story in a minute and 30 seconds to tell your story. 
and to really kind of develop that story into whatever your ask is, um, whatever, mm -hmm. you know. And so really kind of, again, honing in on these little best practices really will help ensure that you're, you're, you're just making it a little bit easier to, to get your, um, your issue processed. Um, I see there are a couple questions. Um, one of the questions really was, people really wanted to know about shell bills. Uh, so Representative Ranson, can you talk a little bit about what a shell bill is? And then we can talk about why we don't like shell bills. <laughs> well, shell bills are basically a blank bill and they have to be in the subject. So let's say I may want to write an education bill. And so I put it, it's under education. And so whatever bill or word that wording that I want to put into it, it has to be education um in, in in as its topic matter but it could be nothing it could be an empty bill for the whole life of it um there are they're kind of the wild cards um cuz shell bills can be created at any time um they can be they can be language from another bill that maybe died and then they change some of the some of the wording and they, they just copied and pasted it into the shell bill and they can run that. Um, so you never really know. And it's, it's, it's a little bit, it makes me nervous to have a shell bill, but it's also good to have as a representative to have a couple shell bills in my pocket, just in case um, I have a, an idea that's late to the table. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I can go, okay, well, I've got this shell bill. I have an education bill. That's an education bill idea. So let's see if I can use a shell bill for a, a bill going forward. But it is, it is a wild card. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Stacey, I didn't know if you were back. I, I'm back. I'm okay. so sorry. I worked all day on my internet, but I guess everybody's at home now and I'm sharing my band look like it's a party line or something. I don't know. <laughs> no problem. No problem. <laughs> but I'm glad y'all can y'all can keep the conversation mm -hmm. going. So we just it sounds like we were just talking about shell bills. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Uh oh, I think we <laughs> it's just going to take it's going to take tenacity on the on the yes. part of the person who's introducing the bill. It's not it's not one Facebook post and then, you know, it just magically becomes um, a law after that. So yeah. um, keeping in mind that tenacity. Um, so I think that we, we've covered pretty much the 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 run of it. So do we have any resources like with your individual organizations do you have resources for folks to stay involved or on top of things or if you have a call to action how do they get involved with your organizations mm -hmm. well Roxy, with, with uh, together oklahoma uh, we have chapters and we have several chapters around the state and one of my jobs is to build more chapters um but until COVID goes away it's kind of hard for me to get out and do that um, but like I said, my job is to train advocates mm -hmm. and I, I teach them what we're talking about tonight, how a bill becomes a law, you know, all the different steps it goes through. And then I teach advocacy classes, the best way to make personal contact. You know, you, ha you have to be best friends with the legislator's administrative assistant because a lot of times the legislator is going to be on the floor. And it's not that you will be ignored, but you need to have, be good friends with their assistant so they will, you know, take your phone call. They will make sure your email gets through. And if you want your legislator to respond to you, you know, let them know. Could could they call me back this evening? I have something really, really important I want to talk with them about. Mm -hmm. And right now, there's not going to be a lot of in-person meetings going on with, with covid uh, and probably the next best thing to advocating other than being in person is making phone calls. You know, pick up the phone, call them, talk to them. And, and that way you can say exactly what you would be saying is if you were in person. Um, and then I would say the next best way to contact them is with a personal letter. If you have time 
just, you know, sit down, write a letter, introduce yourself, tell them a little bit about yourself, where you're from, what your passions are, uh, or send them an email. If it's a bill that's being voted on today, make a phone call, send them an email, say, this is why I want you to vote this way. Okay. Good. Uh, and just bug the crap out of them, you know? I mean, really, they, they, they may, they may get to say, "Oh my God, Roxanne's calling again." But at least I know who Roxanne is. Yes. You know, and they will know that when Roxanne calls, she's not calling just to chit chat. Yes. She has something important to say. So yeah, don't don't be afraid. Stay in touch with them. Be, become their best friend. <laughs> And I think you brought up another point, too, that you can kind of hone in on issues that you're interested in. I think my first introduction to bill tracking, I tried to track everything, and I swear it was a full-time job. I just, mm -hmm. I was looking at schedules and watching live streams and try to keep up with everything. But if you just kind of get into a, a kind of a topical bill search or bill tracking that you're doing, it, it probably be much easier and then too, your name is associated with that subject um, mm -hmm. for that legislator at that point. Yeah. yeah. You know, and I would also suggest um, that there's really two, there's so many different paths to creating policy. Yeah. Um, and, and, and I think it's really important for the community to know that, um, um, you know, we hear this all the time, it's a marathon, not a sprint. But one of the suggestions I do have, and I think this goes back to some of the questions that I know we're getting regarding how does the media play a role, is that um, one of the best things that can you can do really is to get community engagement. So even maybe before, really think about if a bill is, if bill um, deadline is in December, really kind of calendar back until May or right after the last session ends, to really think about this is a piece of legislation I want to push. So take that four or five months to really um, gain some community support. So get those power players, whoever those are, whatever that means, on on your side to help you advocate. So you get leaders, you know, faith community leaders and and other advocates. And so by the time December rolls around. You have this whole list of folks that have signed off on a letter or signed off on something to, to really um, help you move the needle and move your legislation. Um, I would also suggest is that uh, one of the questions I know that we have is like, what role does media play? Um, media can be your best friend and can be your worst enemy. Um, but, but if you are going to get in front of the media, um, my suggestion really is, is that you have a person that is directly impacted by your bill or by the legislation to speak on it. Um, in my in at my old job, as you know, I was the Planned Parenthood lobbyist. I was the Planned Parenthood spokesperson, but I wasn't necessarily the person impacted when a legislator would try to pass an anti-abortion bill. So finding someone who was going to be directly impacted or finding a patient was so important. So really kind of think about holistically about, you know, the bill you're trying to impact uh, or the bill you're trying to push and who's really impacted and maybe getting them in front of the media and getting them in front of, you know, using social media um, for, for to garner support or garner outrage wherever you are. Um, I, think, I think there's just so many ways to, you know, different ways that we can go about pushing policy. And I just don't want us to think and want the community to think you only have to go this way. I, th I think most of us know that um, some of the best policy has been pushed because there was so much outrage by the community that the folks had, it, that the policymakers had, had to move, you know? So mm -hmm. I, I wanted to suggest that as well. Okay, awesome. Mm -hmm. All right. Any other thoughts? Just well, another good, good speaking of media, uh, mm -hmm. sort is to write letters to your editor. Mm -hmm. um, I do that quite often. But if you're really passionate about something, you know, send it in. They, they will print it in the paper, send them one a month or one a week or whatever, you know, and they'll publish them as they can. But keep it in the mind of the public. Don't let people forget uh, what your passion is 
And if people come to know that you're going to be talking about this and then they're going to come and they're going to join you. And, and something that was mentioned a while ago was about knowing the power of people. That is something that I teach on any, on any issue that we're focusing on. I tell the advocates, I said, make a PowerPoint, mm -hmm. put, put, put the person in the middle that you think has the most influence. Mm -hmm. But then you start working out from there. You say, is, you know, can his brother-in-law convince him to vote the way I want to? Well, he'll be part of your power circle or maybe his preacher or maybe his second grade teacher. You never know who's going to have influence on the person that you are trying to influence. And it may not all the, the best way to reach your goal may not be to start at the top. It may be to start at the bottom and work into the middle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and also, you know, may not just be the positive power person, but the negative power person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So who is going to be the voices against what your bill idea is or your issue and work to identify who those people are who are going to work against, find out what their issues are, why mm -hmm. they would fight you on this, and then see if you can't find ways mm -hmm. of... Um, making that a an non argument and mm -hmm. you know and i think you know like 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 i said at the beginning advocacy is relationship mm -hmm. and when you have a name and a face and a relationship with someone whether that is someone for you or against you it affects your advocacy and it affects your adv mm -hmm. advocacy for the better so you really need to work on those relationships okay mm -hmm. I just saw something pop up in the in the comments there for Tamaya about young people and the future of public pol or public policy. Where do you see that going, and how can they get involved? Yep, I think it's so important for young folks to be involved in public policy. I think for so long, many folks have thought uh, public policy was very much a mature person's game. It was about folks that you know had the time to to hire a lobbyist. And in my experience, the true power and the true impact happens at the grassroots level. So when when one person is, in, and, and I say one person is impacted, the, re, the recognition or the realization is, the, or the reality is, is that you may have this idea because of something ha personal happened to you, but someone else has experienced that and kind of finding those who those folks are and getting those people to kind of say, you know what, I had that same experience. Thank you so much for reaching that. Um, but what young people do best and what young people I'm always amazed with is that young people are so connected. And I think that's because of their knowledge of social media that I'm still trying to learn. Um, I have a 17 year old son that I'm always like, okay, how does TikTok work or where does this new social media like young folks are not on Facebook, right? They're not on Facebook. No, not. So <laughs> us trying to advocate for an issue on Facebook to young people is probably not where we should be. Um, but but really empowering them or giving them the giving them maybe not giving teaching them like the processes, I think is really important. But young people have to know that they have everything that they need to really push, you know, policy forward. And a lot of the times it's for, for older folks like us to sometimes step back and let them have it and let them say they can do it. They have everything that they need. They don't need us maybe just to write a check sometimes. Um, um, I think that's really important, but uh, I really think that um, getting young folks involved and they're already involved. So let's, let me be very, you know, I'm honest about that is so important. I think what we can do to help sure ensure that they feel empowered and have the 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 tools that they need, um, because for so long in Oklahoma, the public policy has not been transparent. I'm just gonna put that out there. You know how deals are made or or how policy passed. I remember in my very you know. Now I'm still in all the business, but no one's there anymore when I first started, thanks to term limits. So I remember being in legislators' rooms um, and, and, and another legislator coming in saying, hey, if you do this, I'll let your bill be heard in committee. And really kind of seeing how the sausage is made was very frustrating because I was a young 
person really saying that's not how policy should happen. You know, a, a law that's going to impact me should not happen behind closed doors. It should be transparent. It should be over communicated. Um, and and that should be um, a that should be something that we all should be demanding uh, of our of our elected officials and our and our policymakers is that it's transparent. Everyone should know how this bill got to where it is. Um, and I think, and I say all that to say is that I think young folks, because they're so connected, because um, they have the, um, a lot of the times they have the passion that maybe some of us have lost throughout the years. Um, that is why I, I've always said young people continue to be the ones that kind of move Oklahoma forward. And I always look forward to seeing ways that we can help them find, you know, find their voice um, when, when needed. You know, as a teacher, this is like right up my alley here because as a teacher, I mean, I've been trying to form the next generation of how to speak up for themselves and how to advocate for the things that they believe in. Um, I was a music teacher, so we use music to do that. And all of that realm, we've created a world that is different for younger communities um, than than where I grew up. And I think that's what the, the hard part is, is that, I mean, we need all ages to be part of, of policy because of the world that it, it impacts them too. And it impacts all of us. And, and we can't just make policy because we think that's best for them. Because that goes back to what Tamaya said earlier, is that, you know, policy without representation is not really a good thing. So mm -hmm. you want to make sure that everybody's voices are heard. And, and that's difficult because we have this idea that, okay, well, you got to grow old and then you got to mm -hmm. run for office once you're old. Mm -hmm. Well, if you have everyone who's in that mindset, then they're only thinking about their world that they grew up in. And they're yeah. not seeing that our young people live in a completely different world than what we were raised in. Oh yeah, they do. <laughs> mm -hmm. Absolutely. I have a, I have a, he's 18, he'll be 19 here pretty soon. And I don't know where his head is half the time. <laughs> he also told me that only old people use Facebook. So if I needed him, I needed to Instagram chat or but you but but i think what happens is it helps us become more creative right it helps us to really think okay when we are trying to advocate for this bill um and and, and i'm talking about organizations that tend to have like a budget so when when we have a budget why are we just marketing on facebook ads so like we should be you know marketing on tiktok so it really having young people at the table is so important um, and, and, and Representative Ransom said it best, you know, we have to be of the model of no decision about us without us, that, that, that young folks are at the table, even if we're talking about 401ks, young folks should yeah. be at the table because maybe that policy around 401ks isn't gonna, you know, have a negative impact because of the way they mature or something like that. I don't know. I still don't know about 401ks, right? But like, just to say, <laughs> having, you know, having representation is so important, and and, and that is why, um, you know, we we have to ensure that that when we have policymakers, they need to look like us. You know, they need to be teachers that are you know teaching and not necessarily administrators or superintendents. They need to have have folks that that are truly representative of the community, and 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 that's how we move Oklahoma forward. And I know that's the goal of all of us here. Yeah, yes. I think it'll be really exciting in this upcoming session with um, Jose Cruz and Mari Turner coming in. Um, mm -hmm. I'm, really, I'm really interested to see how that goes because I don't know if there's, I don't know the average age of the legislators, but I'm glad that they're there. So mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> at least there's some different ideas on the table and some different exactly. conversations going. Mm -hmm. um, right. I think that's great. Um, so, Representative Ranson and uh, Roxanne, have y'all heard the uh, younger voices yet in your ear? Are they there? Are we, are we still working to get them? <laughs> Actually, uh, I spent a lot of the summer mm -hmm. registering voters. Okay. And the majority of the people who I got registered were younger people. Cool. And... Um, 
now my job, now that I have them registered, is to get them to vote, of course. But in the meantime, is to teach them exactly what we've been talking about tonight. Yeah. Why it's important to vote, what it really means, um, how you go about influencing the policy that you want to see, how you become the change that you want to see in your community. Mm -hmm. Where to start? Is it a city issue? Is it a county issue? Is it a state issue? You know, you have you have to be speaking to the correct power in order to really make a change. And that's where I come in. That's I teach them how to do what they need to do to be an important voice. Okay. Right. I, I it's it, the hard thing is the, the, the lag of between yeah. the age to register to vote and mm -hmm. the when they took their civics class. And mm -hmm. in Oklahoma, it's about eighth, ninth grade. Well, you know, I don't remember anything that happened in eighth and ninth grade other than boys. I mean, <laughs> I, it's, I think that's what's frustrating because then all of a sudden they get to the point where they're ready to vote and they don't even know um, how to register to vote, what to do and why they would want to and so forth. Um, you know, I'm, I'm lucky that my children are basically my youngest just registered to vote this year. She just turned 18. So um, I've got a 20 year old and 18 year old. And so they, to see it through their eyes has been a really great experience to go, mm -hmm. okay, this is, this is the roadblocks that we're getting here. Okay. So how do we get past that? And yes. this last campaign was where it was, I had quite a few folks on my campaign that were college age because mm -hmm. I want to know this information and I want to, you know, they're, as, they're asking me for information about how things work and mm -hmm. I'm going, okay, well, what issues do you see that, mm -hmm. that are in your area? And that's a really hard connection to make for some folks of, mm -hmm. okay, well, I see this problem. Well, it's a problem. And I, but I don't realize like, oh, you mean I could possibly be part of fixing that problem? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You mm -hmm. know, there's that, that's the connection that has to be made. And so I think it's, it's good to to basically be surrounded by a lot a diversity of voices because mm -hmm. then you hear lots of different viewpoints and that is helpful in finding a path going forward yeah that's a great point that's that's awesome so yeah just getting them can i say them and i keep saying that because i have an 18 year old <laughs> <laughs> talk to them like a bunch of kids but you know you're, you're coming out of your mom's house or your dad's house or your your um whoever's house you're coming out of and you're so used to being told what to do then you you finally graduate or you're headed to college or you're in your first job and then you realize that you have power to change mm -hmm. that is, that's kind of a hurdle sometimes for for them to understand that they can affect change at that point so mm -hmm. um just getting them out and that tenacity because mm -hmm. there's a lot going on in yeah. everybody's life no matter if you're 18 and you're that's You're right. 40. There's yeah. a lot going on and it takes a lot of time to get these um, ideas out in front of people and continue to advocate for it. Because you Yes. Have to and exercising your right to vote is exercise. You have exercise. to keep <laughs> practicing mm -hmm. and yes. you have to vote every election. Yes. And, you know, I mean, because it's important. It's important yes. to vote for your Board of Ed members even though you may not be in the element or you might not be in the education system, the public education system, it's still important to vote for your representation there. And, and so you should vote for every, every time there's an election, you should vote. Yeah. And I think, and I think that actually what is a good point. And I think there is a responsibility for us that are representing organizations that have been um, registering folks to vote. We also have that responsibility to like keep up that same energy to keep them involved. It's like the, registering to vote, voting, and then following and holding your elected officials that you voted for accountable is all part of the civic process. And I think that's, I think the accountability part is sometimes lost during you know the slow down the slow periods when we don't have an election it feels like there's an election every 30 minutes now but but really like <laughs> keeping and how do we ensure and engaging the folks that you know we're excited to vote 
Um, and, and saying this vote meant, you know, one more pro reproductive health or pro criminal justice reform person in our legislature, but now we got to do the work. And, you know, and so, so really, is like I said, is the duty of organizations like ours that that we keep up that same energy um, to get folks involved in the policy part because that's ultimately why we're electing people to vote is to change policy, and, and that's been a struggle. But I think it's more important than ever, especially right now, and not to get very like election focused, but. The reality is we're in Oklahoma and this session will be a tough session for many of us that are on the progressive side of, of the work um, because of a backlash from a Biden administration um, from our elected officials, what that could mean. So we could see very, um, you know, bills that are extremely or issues that are extremely important to us, you know, go to the wayside because folks are because a very conservative legislature like we have currently, you know, could truly, you know, push back some of the forward progress that we've made. So it is many of us who worked, did a lot of electoral work um, for the last two years, honestly, are really concerned about what sessions look like in some of our more conservative states and Oklahoma being one of them. Um, so I think it's more important now that people are just as involved and just as excited about the election, really focusing on our, our session that starts in February because um, because a lot of those gains could be lost because of having a legislature that looks like ours right now. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Agreed. You know, we're down to we're down to 19 members in the minority caucus, which I am a member of. And so that is that's pretty daunting, you know, mm -hmm. and the the Republican leadership has talked about how I mean you know they've got 82 members so therefore they have the, they believe that Oklahoma is pro conservative which mm -hmm. you know I think it's a hard place to be in Oklahoma right now because in Oklahoma Trump won mm -hmm. in the United States he didn't so how do you how do you make ends meet in that type of environment mm -hmm. and you're right I mean there's going to be it's going to be very interesting. I mean, it was interesting two years ago when I walked into the house mm -hmm. to begin with, but um, it's going to be harder because there's only mm -hmm. 19 in the Democrats in the minority caucus. And that's, that's going to be hard. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which I think is even more of a reason um, as to why community activists and advocates should be really talking to um, Democrats or progressives um, you know, people that are trying to push forward because um, it'll be very, very easy for bills just to get, you know, passed through, but really giving um, legislators the information um, and saying, you know, I know this, you know, I say this all the time, I know this bill's gonna pass, but could you please ask this question? Could you right. please debate? You know, I'm sure Representative Ranson has received many emails from me. It's like, I know it's gonna happen, but we have a duty and we have an obligation to, to, to frame our narrative in the way um, that's important. We have a duty to put people's, um, the impact that it's having on people has to be heard on the floor. Even if we know it's gonna pass, you know, 82 to 19, um, people still deserve, you know, the other side to be heard. And, and, and I think that that's what I've appreciated from Representative Ranson and, other, and our other um, elected officials that they knew that it was still, Gonna pass, but it did not stop them by any means to get that message out. You're right because you know a lot of the the members that are in the House they won by a very small majority, mm -hmm. so there is the opposition in their districts, and we really have to. I mean, I am a voice for for those who aren't getting heard, and. Because there are there are folks in a district that has a Republican as their representative who aren't getting heard, um, so I I feel like I need to be that voice and that ear. But what fro what bothers me too is that a lot of times folks will go, okay, well I'm really wanting to advocate for this issue, but my representative he's not going to listen or she's not going to listen. Mm -hmm. Okay, yes, it's possible, but you still have to create that relationship. Um, there was, there was a bill the first session and I, I don't even remember what it was, but I voted against it. And the reason I voted against it is because I didn't fully understand it, but there were several individuals who, um, were in that realm 
in their previous life and they voted no so i voted no because i just like okay gonna use that well i had a lobbyist come up to me afterwards and, and was like well why did you vote no on that and i'm like well i didn't understand it and he and he was upset with me and i'm like well hold up that's your job you didn't talk to me about this you can't just ex mm -hmm. think i'm gonna vote for it because i'm a democrat or whatever i don't know what the issue was but uh you gotta have a conversation with me and that was kind of you know that's that's part of the reason why i think it's going to be difficult going forward is that you know it's 19 votes aren't necessarily needed to pass something because you know they could a budget issue could be passed without 19 votes so it's you still have to communicate because i can ask some really good questions questions are my love language so i can ask some really good mm -hmm. questions but you've got to communicate with me because i need to know what questions are really the important questions to ask mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. i think we have a couple of things here in the in the chat let's see um we have a question on what did we talk about how a bill can die in the rules committee i'm i don't know if i missed that when i dropped off a couple of times um no i don't think so um okay. rules committee is kind of like uh the island of misfit toys <laughs> And so, you know, all bills have to be assigned to a committee. And uh -huh. oftentimes um, the rules committee is where a bill will be assigned when um, leadership doesn't want it heard or um, for whatever reason. And um, so oftentimes if it gets assigned to rules, mm -hmm. then you know that, okay, um, you have to, or I, as the representative, has to um, do a little maneuvering to see if I can get my bill out of rules and get heard in another committee. Um, and it's not to say that rules doesn't meet, they do meet, and um, but there are a lot of bills on their docket, which they will never get to. Yep. Yep, and the, another comment we have is that, you know, COVID has really clogged the wheels quite a bit and it's hard to keep folks energized. Well, that's true. And just yes. what we were talking about earlier on how the the legislature is so conservative in this session that it can seem daunting and it can seem overwhelming, but we have to keep our voices at all levels heard, mm -hmm. um, whether it is still send your ideas in, still um, try to get policy changed, send your questions to the legislators so they can ask the ask the questions on the floor during debate but we have to keep involved because if, i think if we go quiet they're just going to think we've just gone away totally and if, if we don't then that's that's everybody i mean that's yeah. everybody on every level right now you know and I, and I would actually maybe caution us to kind of think about reshifting that is that COVID has definitely been on the forefront of minds, but it's also opened up a lot of opportunity. We, we know that remote work is a lot different um, than, than, than we've ever thought, but people are able to multitask in a way that we've never known. Just ask, you know, moms right now or, or parents, I guess right now, or, are able to multitask in a way. So, may, so I think it's upon organizations like us to kind of find a way of how do we make sure that, you know, we're able to kind of respect and honor a lot of the the difficulties and, and experiences of people, but also just kind of connect. Like, um, it's bad policy. It is policy why maybe unemployment checks are not as high as they were. You know, like that is policy related, or it is policy related um, of not having mask man mask mandates. You know, like really kind of connecting that that is all policy, and that's our all of our opportunity to to truly um impact you know when, when we come together so that is something that we're always thinking about really is like yes COVID has really shifted a lot of thinking but it's also we have to really see it as an opportunity and where can we you know where, where can we use that opportunity right because yeah. it's really kind of broke open a lot of things a lot of things mm -hmm. that we thought were a given okay mm -hmm. this is the way government runs this is how it is and it's never going to change and we're seeing, oh, wait, you mean we could think of it in a different way? You mean mm -hmm. we could try something else? And mm -hmm. that's what's been, I mean, just it's, it's, it's an equalizer of sorts, you know, mm -hmm. where you see, mm -hmm. oh, okay, so 10 years of cuts 
have resulted in the fact that we've never been able to update the computer system for um, unemployment. Mm -hmm. Oh, mm -hmm. that's a big problem, you know? Mm -hmm. And so going mm -hmm. forward, oh, maybe we need to really look at how we yes. spend our money, not just the dollar amount. Yes. And start cutting. Let's, let's really focus where we want to put our money and make that our moral contract with mm -hmm. our fellow citizens. And that's really, mm -hmm. I'm hoping that we can go forward. You know, the session is going to be awful. Uh, it's mm -hmm. the, the mm -hmm. amount of money that we do not have available to us. Um, and, you know, it's, it's going to be awful. But I think maybe we can actually relook at it and go, wait yes. a minute, what are our, what are our really our true beliefs? And going forward, how do we really want to fund our society? And I think that yeah. could be a great opportunity. Great mm -hmm. point, Representative Ransack. I think, you know, if we all believe, and I think the organizations that we've said it before, you know, a budget is a moral document, right? And and if yes. we truly have that opportunity to, to really see where are the priorities of the state of Oklahoma, um, where are the priorities of those in power? Right now, it's the a very conservative legislature. Um, and so, it is very difficult to get people excited about a budget. I, I get that, but I think that's as, as Representative Ranson said, is like that's an opportunity that we cannot let pass um, in, a, in, a, in a session that we are going to see tremendous budget cuts. In a session where COVID still is very much going to permeate the conversation, you know, where is this conservative legislature going to put their dollars? And and then more importantly, how do we hold them accountable to ensure that people are put first? Then we have another thing here in the comments. Um, it says that it's off topic, but it's it's on topic. Um, so for Representative Ranson, um, can you address the comment that the minority caucus no longer has any rule representation? Ah, uh, yes. So I had a, a um, I had someone in the media contact me after the election and ask me how I felt being the last rural Democrat. <laughs> And um, in essence, I am in the sense that um, Stillwater o OSU educates a lot of our rural uh, members, uh, community members. And so that may. Mm -mm. She needs some of that rural broadband too. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's policy, right? If we had rural, better rural right, broadband. Unstable communication or connection. There you go. There you are. <laughs> oh, we lost her. See, that's what happens when you don't have any rural representation in your internet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, but at the same time, that means that we need we need folks in the rural communities to come forward with those with those bills that you know affect the rural areas maybe that they affect the urban areas a little bit different because um rural folks need the the social safety nets i mm -hmm. think more so sometimes than the the urban com uh, communities because um there's just so many, many. less mm -hmm. opportunities um that that present themselves so mm -hmm just making sure that we can get those voices heard too. Um, we're, we got about 15 minutes left here. Um, and we, we were just, we were talking. I'm sorry. <laughs> now I'm having the issue. Maybe I am a rural it's member. Like I don't Saturday know. Saturday Night Live Zoom skit. <laughs> <laughs> no, back to the question. I mean, it's, it's, yeah. All of our Democrats in our minority caucus are in the um, our municipalities, uh, Oklahoma City, yeah. Tulsa, Norman, and pretty much where we are. We get the gist. I think we're losing her again, but yeah. yes. So we lost. We lost our rural representation in the in the Democrat side there. So um, it's up to us. The, I won't call us country folks, but the country folks. Right. Are up some. <laughs> I think such <laughs> a great point. Issues that mm -hmm. that, ma that matter to us. Yeah, um, I agree. So make the, make those known. Um, 
like I said, we got about 15 minutes left here. It's It's been a great conversation. Thank you, ladies, so much. Um, I think basically, you will go. Basically, what we're hearing is it's going to take time, it's going to take tenacity, and it's going to take a lot of effort um, this session going forward and just in general to get a bill um, into a law, but well worth it at the end whenever we are getting those things that are near and dear to our hearts and the community um, at large um, into into law or policy there. I agree. Anything, anything you ladies want to say to wrap us up here? I just want to say that people, you know, if people find their passion tied in a particular bill to stay focused on it and never let up, yep. be making constant contact with your legislator. And, and you don't just have to reach out to like-minded people, okay. you know, reach out to the Republican side. If you have a Republican legislator, mm -hmm. which apparently most of us do. <laughs> yeah. Okay, that may that's going to be your only avenue, you know, into the state capitol. So you're going to have to work out a relationship with that person. You don't have to be best friends, but you have to respect each other. And you have to learn how to talk to someone that's not going to agree with you all the time. Yeah, absolutely. Yep, I, I, yeah, I think the only thing I would add is that there's a lot of resources out there, but most importantly, um, there are organizations like the ACLU, like Together Oklahoma, um, and, and many amazing legislators like uh, Representative Ranson that are so willing to help kind of help you power map and think through and, and, and feel free to utilize the, the resources that we have. Um, and more importantly, I think um, it's just that for me, I come from this very organized, professional lobbyist perspective. So kind of keep that in mind. Take that for what it's worth. You know, passion will always trump, you know, anything that I've said. Tenacity will always trump anything that I said. So, so just really encouraging folks that there's not a wrong, wrong way or right way to do it. Um, you know, getting your policy and getting your message out there is just get it out there. Um, and, and really the job of all of us should be to hold elected officials accountable and that's accountable to you to ensure that your voice is heard. So, so just, I think remembering that, I think will help folks, you know, get, get those ultimately move Oklahoma forward, which I think is the goal of all of us. Yes. Representative Branson. I'm sorry. What was the question? <laughs> We're just closing out. If you have any, any. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, I think this is great. And, in. Honestly, I think everyone, you know, with the idea of, of staying engaged, um, Tamaya and Roxanne, this is great information that you presented today. Um, it's, I think we're all kind of got uh, election fatigue where, you know, the, there's such a big push to election day and then it's like all of a sudden it's over. And mm -hmm. um, it's good to rest. It's good to kind of regroup but know that you know it's the fight is still on and we still have to engage and make as many friends as we can and try to get mm -hmm. your message across to as many people as you can um so that that way um your tenacity will will pay off awesome thank you ladies for joining us um whether you are going to try to get a bill into a law um you engage your legislators or you hold your legislators accountable However you choose to stay engaged, stay engaged, because we don't want to be back in the same spot here in a couple of couple of years. We don't want to do this again. So true. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, for um, organizing this for us. Um, and that is it. Y'all have a good night. Thank, right, you. Thank you. All right. Thank you.